Hi everyone, this is Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy. Today I'm talking about human factors and converting a European 62366-1 usability file to meet FDA requirements. Um, this is going to be a topic of discussion at our 510k workshop in Amsterdam on October 10th and 11th. So I wanted to give a little introduction to the topic and share it with people, as well as remind people that the conference is coming up in just one week. So uh, this is going to be a brief video. I'm going to go through a couple of the most common questions, but this workshop is very small. We have a very few number of people signed up. So therefore, we're going to have a lot of time to spend with each individual person and answer their questions. We also have networking sessions in between the speakers. So we have an opportunity to answer uh, private questions that are specific to your device. Mary Vodder will be a speaker, and I'll be a speaker. So most common question, what is a human factor study? Human factor studies are not clinical studies. Human factors are not actually using the device to treat people. Those are clinical studies, or if you were doing it on animals, an animal study. Human factor studies are simulated use. So you have volunteers that are healthy, that are not being treated with the product, making sure that they can use the device. And the focus is on the user, not on the patient. Um, you do have uh, devices that the user is also the patient, but the focus of a human factor study is the user. And you're looking for what is the user group, and that has to be very well defined in your study and you're trying to get them to use the device properly in, according to, in accordance with the instructions for use that you provide with your product. And if you provide a video with your product to help train people, you could provide that as well, but how well can they use your device intuitively without making a mistake um, and causing some sort of unforeseen uh, injury to themselves or getting erroneous results? Another question is, what is the difference between a usability study and a human factor study? Nothing. Um, there are two different terms that are used. In general, internationally, they use the term usability, and the FDA prefers the words human factors. There really is no difference between those two standards or those two words or concepts. They really mean the same thing. So, can you use a CE marking usability file for your 510k submission? Yes, if it meets the requirements, but usually no. Particularly if you're a European company that did your usability study in Europe. Usability studies, the FDA requires that the usability study involve users that are from the country where the products can be marketed, the US. So if you don't have US users, not allowed. And there, there may be an opportunity to request that up front, but for the most part, the FDA says, no, you have to have users from the US. They also specify a number. I see a lot of studies, oh, we did three users. We did 10 users. The FDA said a minimum of 15 from each user group. So if you have the pro a product that could be both used by clinicians in a hospital environment and a product that could be used at home, or maybe a third environment by EMTs in, a, in an ambulance. That's three different user groups. Now you might be able to make the argument, we're only gonna do the human factor study on the layman because they're the worst case scenario group with the least skill and most likely to make mistakes. And you might also be able to make the argument that EMTs and doctors use this type of device all the time and are very familiar with how to operate it and are unlikely to make a mistake. But whenever there's a human factors risk that you need to verify your risk controls work, your instructions, your training, your design of the device is intuitive, that people won't use it mistakenly and cause injury or get erroneous results. If that's the case, you're going to have to do a human factor study. And sometimes if there's a difference between your product and the competitor product, that may also trigger it. What are some of the most common mistakes? Like I said, 15 patients and I see three and 10. That's a common, the wrong number of people. Another thing you have to keep in mind, particularly with layperson studies, 
is you need to consider people that are of low reading functionality. I don't mean people that are retarded. I don't mean people that are dumb and have a low IQ. I mean people that are having trouble reading. Not all of our society is literate. So there are a large number of people out there, unfortunately, that don't have the ability to read your instruction for use, particularly when the readability score says I need a college degree. So you need to make sure that your instruction for use are readable, and you need to test that by testing people with a low literary score, literacy score. Another thing you have to consider is people that are elderly. Um, you, don't, you don't have um, a lot of devices coming out now um, that are um, that are just like what we always used to have. Today, all the devices seem to have a mobile component or a software component. Everything is being become integrated with the internet. So now you're going to have to have devices that not only are they integrated with the internet, but they also have to be usable by the elderly. And not all the elderly can use a Wi-Fi device or a Bluetooth device without any trouble. So you have to evaluate that specific risk as well. Even simple things like being able to double click are hard for some people, particularly if you have, uh, um, a, let's say a device was for a certain population that had tremors, uh, they may not have the same dexterity of other users. So you have to look at the intended use population and that make it, make it very difficult to do a human factor study for certain types of indications and you might be forced into a clinical study instead. Is a human factor study always required? Um, no, it's not always required. Um, if you make a product, the whole, the whole premise behind a 510K submission is that there's another product already legally marketed on the, in the US market that is similar to yours, equivalent. So the more equivalent it is, the less likely you have to do a human factor study. And there's been a lot of cases where the FDA has even said, you don't need to provide clinical data for certain types of devices if it's the same risk factors and the same equivalent design. But the more your product is different, the more you, the graphic user interface is different for your device, the more likely it is you're going to need to use a human factor study. So always think about the rationale that you're gonna provide the FDA for why you don't need this study. And then we don't even need to convert your European C marking usability file to something the FDA is gonna accept. Instead, we can just avoid that requirement by saying it's the same as somebody else's product, the predicate we've chosen, but that's not always possible. So the newer and the better and the more improved your product is, the more likely we're gonna to have to consider human factors. Okay, um, our workshop begins at 10 a.m., I'm sorry, 9 a.m. on Wednesday of next week. So it's coming up very fast. And if you're interested in registering for the event, uh, you can register for the link that, that I've just shown up there. It's medicaldeviceacademy.com, Amsterdam-510K-workshop. And if you go on there, you can register. You can use your credit card. It's only $600. The hotel still has room. It's at the Amsterdam Central Station or right next door to the Amsterdam Central Station at the Doubletree Hotel in Amsterdam. It, you just go out of the Amsterdam Central Station, hang a left, and try to get, not to get run over by bicycles. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing you all at the Amsterdam workshop and have a great day. Thank you.